challenging uh, issues of privacy, of, da of data, of ethics, of patient care. Um, and uh, Lisa and team have been uh, really pulling together um, some fascinating program and, and supporting some uh, important thinking. Uh, it's been great to be part of that. Um, it's nice to be able to join many of you here today virtually uh, with our friends and colleagues at um, CMU who are really doing some novel and intriguing work, uh, really advancing the boundaries of what is um, happening and what is feasible in biometrics. Um, we thought uh, when we thought through a topic for this year, um, pre the COVID um, pandemic, uh, we thought that biometrics was starting to become such a significant um, uh, advance um, uh, and starting to be used in uh, such a broad range of ways, not only in society, but in the interaction of society and health systems, uh, whether from patient care, uh, tracking uh, items, um, scanning, um, the whole range of issues that we'll touch on today. Um, little did we know that this would only be intensified um, uh, as COVID kicked in um, and uh, there became a, a, a rush to see which technologies could help track the disease, which could help um, determine who had uh, the disease, who had symptoms, um, and the debates about the efficacy of these technologies, um, whether they were proportional, necessary, legal, lawful, uh, around the world, really occupied many in the privacy and ethics and healthcare um, debates. So we're really delighted uh, that today we'll both be looking at and having a unique opportunity to see and hear from some of the experts who are advancing the science, um, but then also grapple with the privacy challenges and hopefully the way both law, policy, and technology are shaping those challenges. So it's really delightful to have as our third partner, not only CMU, but Dr. Lori Faith Craner, who's been uh, for many of us in the privacy and technology world, a guiding light um, on exactly those challenges, on the challenges of privacy, the challenges of technologies can, that can be used to protect privacy, um, the um, structures. Uh, Lori, for those of you who don't know, and, and I know she's well known to all of us on the privacy side, but to those of you who are swept in here from some of the broader disciplines, Lori is Professor of Computer Science and of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she is Director of the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory, or CUPS. Um, she also leads the um, privacy Masters in Engineering, the Privacy Engineering Masters, which is becoming one of the most um, important sort of new degrees, uh, because to navigate in this environment, whether it's biometrics or any of the other technologies that really call for both deep technical understanding and deep law, policy, and ethics understanding, you really do need the people that are able to um, uh, bridge those goals. So before I introduce uh, Laurie, let me just, um, a couple of notes. Uh, we, are going, we are recording um, this uh, session. Uh, so um, uh, please do uh, take note of that and, and uh, it'll be available for replay uh, afterwards. Uh, we will um, uh, initially have a number of presentations from uh, um, our, uh, our science and technology colleagues. Uh, we'll take some quick questions. So if as uh, some of those presentations go on, you've got questions or, or thoughts. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. If you want to throw it out there for uh, us to bring in, we'll do that. Uh, and then after we break, after those presentations, we'll switch to more of a law and policy discussion. So without any further ado, um, Dr. Lori Faith Craner. Thanks, Jules. Um, so uh, it's, always, it's always delightful to uh, work on these projects with the Future Privacy Forum and with Highmark Health. Uh, so really excited uh, to co-host with them. Um, on behalf of the Scilab Security and Privacy Institute, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, at Scilab, uh, we are doing research related to new biometric technologies, and you'll hear about that. Um, but we also have researchers who are very much focused on privacy and the privacy implications of new technologies. So this really kind of fits into, into the work that we do. Uh, I also especially want to welcome all the students who've joined us today, uh, including the students in our Privacy Engineering Master's Program and other students from universities around the country and perhaps even the world uh, who have joined us. 
Uh, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, uh, my colleague, Mario Savides. Um, professor Savides is the Bossa Nova Robotics Professor of Artificial Intelligence in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon, and is also the founder and director of our Biometric Center. His research is focused on developing core AI and machine learning algorithms that were successfully applied for robust face detection, face recognition, iris biometrics, and most recently, general object detection and scene understanding. He and his team were the first in the world to develop a long range iris capture and matching system capable of acquiring irises up to 12 meters away. And I've seen it in action and it is very cool. Um, he has authored and co-authored over 240 journal and conference publications and has over 40 filed patent applications and 15 issued patents. Uh, in the last two years, he completely rebuilt from ground up the AI algorithms for Bossa Nova Robotics robots for performing inventory analysis and scaling the autonomous robot deployment of this inventory analysis from 20 stores to 500 retail stores running fully autonomously. Whenever I stop by Professor Savidi's lab at CMU, I'm always blown away by the latest demos of biometrics technology. So I'm really looking forward to see what he has for us today. Go ahead. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this opportunity. And let me switch to... Um, so today, everyone, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm really blessed with the opportunity to showcase some of the amazing work we're doing here at Carnegie Mellon uh, at Scilab and the Electrical Computer Engineering Department. And I'm going to talk about facial recognition 2.0. So you've seen biometrics in action in Hollywood, right? And you've seen how facial recognition is amazing and works very well. And you've seen, uh, you know, Tom Cruise get identified about a couple of meters away from the gap in the Minority Report. And you may think that this is science fiction, but I'll show you here at my Scilab lab that actually we built a system that you can see right here and it's capturing my iris 12 meters away and matching in just a couple of seconds. And in fact, we can enroll someone at that distance. And we actually built this about 10 years ago. We even showed you can match through the side view mirror of a car, uh, the, the, uh, the driver using iris. So in, in a time of COVID where everyone is masked and you're looking at facial recognition and you've seen reports from uh, NIST how facial recognition does not work very well, iris is a, a very robust way, almost like fingerprint to do a robust biometric identification. And the iris is part of a face. So I, you know, we always look at it as a different modality, but it is part of your face. So it's what I call in, in of all the things co combined towards facial recognition 2.0. So what are the things that we need to do to do uh, iris recognition? Well, the first thing is you've got to detect the face robustly. So I'm going to later talk about some of the robust research we've done to build algorithms that can find a face even if you're completely masked, which is one of the key problems we face right now in COVID. After you do that, you detect the eye robustly, and then we go in and actually segment out the iris. So the iris is actually the sphincter muscle that contra contracts or dilates your pupil. So this muscle is a unique signature, a un unique biometric identifier, almost as good as your fingerprint. Um, and, and one of the things that we do to actually extract features is we actually unroll the iris. We map it from Cartesian to polar coordinates. And in this domain, we extract features and we and end up with a bit template. So as long as over 70% of bits match in an iris template, we can actually confirm that the person is who it is or match them in a database. Now, some nice facts about iris recognition. Uh, even identical twins have different irises. They may look from a facial identical completely, but the iris is different, just like the fingerprint is. Now, one of the challenges facial recognition faces in general is that we age, the face ages. And so if you enroll someone 20 years ago and you try to match them 20 years later, facial appearance has changed. Well, the iris has not changed. So even as we age, the iris is thought to be uh, constant from the time uh, from a toddler. 
And Iris really got its reputation when a uh, National Geographic photographer captured an image of this girl in Afghanistan. And, you know, after several wars happened, 17 years later, he goes back to the village and he's wondering, well, what happened to this girl with his bright green eyes? Well, he found her. And of course, you know, she, her facial structure changed. She's gone through a lot of hardship. But through the iris pattern, they were able to actually match her and confirm that she's the same person. This is an image of an iris uh, captured by our system at nine meters away. And you can see the clarity of the crypt and the furrows uh, at such long range distance. This is a system from a commercial company where you can see the enrollment image is not really great even from three meters away. So you can see we actually are able to get a really precise image that we can enroll from at nine meters away. Here are some other examples uh, and you can see that we're actually getting as good quality at nine meters away as some of the systems at 15 centimeters away and 30 centimeters away. So that's been a huge achievement we were able to do here at Carnegie Mellon. Now, um, some really great societal applications that eye recognition can play is, you know, they can, it can really be used to find unobtrusively missing or abducted children. When a baby or a toddler is, is, is abducted or a child, uh, it, every second counts, uh, every hour counts. And if someone's not found even within a couple of years, their own parents won't recognize their child just because the face changes so much. Well, Iris is one way we can actually identify that that is a child and you can find, you know, as, as children are being trafficked across the world and borders. So I see Iris as a, as a huge advocate in, in, sell, in, in saving these amazing lives. Now, to going back to what we do in terms of technology, you know, here at Scilab, we look at vulnerabilities. And as we look at vulnerabilities, there are many types of vulnerabilities. And one of them is AI vulnerabilities. And how can somebody thwart a facial recognition system? Well, the first way you thwart a system is, can you go undetected? If I can spoof a system such that I can't find a face, then I've completely bypassed the facial recognition pipeline. So we've worked on building really robust facial detectors that is the first sort of attack gate of any facial recognition system. And I'm gonna show you some of our work here in results. So even though we trained on a, an academic data, so data set, we show that on images we've never seen before, we can find faces even though they are masked, uh, occluded, extremely off angle from surveillance, uh, images that we've never seen before. And the numbers you're seeing here are actually the confidence numbers that these are faces. So this is amazing that we're generalizing AI beyond what we see in training because AI algorithms can actually work really well. Even the most simplest AI algorithms work if you have good training data and your test data is very similar. But they don't work as well when your test data is very different. So here we're showing how we go beyond what we've trained on. Uh, even when you have completely masked individuals, we can find faces. So this is, is a great way in terms of when you're trying to count how many people are in a store or in a line and you want to do uh, social distancing. Well, if you can find the face and you can make sure, well, am I six, am I six feet away? Am I further away? Can I find a masked individual? Can I, can I try to recognize someone even if they're wearing a mask in the times of COVID? And that's the first uh, thing we've developed. And we actually built this technology several years ago. So it's actually quite mature now. Even faces that are blurred. And you can see uh, here at the time of, of, of SARS, uh, we can find faces that are uh, completely masked, blurred, and even low resolution. Uh, here's an example of looking at crowds and trying to see, well, do we have clusters? Is there, is there a game? Is there a big gathering that should be dispersed because that could be a next COVID cluster. These are all the kind of things that we can analyze by having this robust facial detection software. Um, and again, uh, what amazes me here is that you have individuals that are not only masked, but also have an eye patch. Uh, and here you have people that are masked very far away in the background. And you can still, we can still detect them really robustly. And this is the key thing about detection. One of the things is that we really need to minimize false positives. So we have to have a high true accept rate. We wanna make sure we find faces, even if they're masked. But, we, but at the same time, it's not a simple case that we're just changing a threshold and we're finding, and then we're getting all these false positives. 
No, we've actually built very robust detections that can find the object we're looking for, and even though the images are very low resolution and occluded in the, in the background, even through windshields. Um, and so here's just some more examples, camouflaged individuals, Now, the next pillar of working in a facial recognition algorithm is extracting facial features. So here we actually show we can extract a 3D model of a face. And here we have, we're running a, our facial algorithm on uh, a video from Hillary Clinton. And the blue lines that you're seeing here, the jawline is actually occluded. We can't actually see that. But our algorithm is actually extracting, extrapolating where that, 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 that line is. So it's, it's it's key to be able to actually do all this robustly. And SDM is a, is a, is a method that's been out in, in commercial industry, and we show that actually we can match robustly even though the extreme of angles. What we're actually doing is fitting a 3D model that's about 67,000 vertices. So here you're seeing the model being fit on our faces, on, on, on my students' faces, and this model is actually independent. Every frame is independently being fitted. There's no temporal tracking. And we can use this to actually build a model from a single image and generate how a person looks like at any angle. So there's a lot of power to what we've developed, even in the presence of occlusions. Here we're showing how we're comparing to an actual. So this is from a single image that's showing the reconstruction. We even do things like post correction to try to match a face even if at extreme angles by giving back the half face. So there are many applications in law enforcement where you have to forensically maintain information because some, someone who looks very similar to someone else may be different because they have a mole. So rather than using some of the hallucination methods, here what we're doing is we're extrapolating pixels and, and, and make, ensuring that any forensic information is being preserved at this half face and use that for recognition. Here's a, a small, this is an older demo of one of my students walking and being matched. I'm just gonna move it forward. So here's gonna get picked up. This is where we just write on a video of the YouTube now we have a large enrollment database here, but we have we don't have anyone from from here. So we just wanted to see that we're not matching anyone. There are no false matches in this, but we're seeing how it's it's detecting. And the detector here is actually an older version, so you can see it's jumping around a bit. But we wanted to see the facial landmarking and the 3D model fitting work. Now some of the work we've done for law enforcement is enhancing extremely low resolution faces, and some of the work we did is during the Boston Marathon case, we took the low resolution image of Zernat live during the investigation, and this was the best image. And that's still a very low, blurry, off angle face uh, where there's occlusion, he's holding a cell phone. And we reconstructed this image at 2.42 a.m. April 19th, that Friday morning. We sent that to the authorities. Now at 9.30, when the MIT officer went and uh, was, was shot by the brother, this image came out and you can see that we did an amazing reconstruction of Zernayev from an image that even my brain cannot imagine what he looks like. So that's the power of AI. We can do things that now the human brain cannot, is not able to do. We later showed after the fact that we could have matched him in a database of a million uh, faces using a decade old algorithm. Uh, we've also done work in showing that we can actually match faces that are occluded. So that if we're just using the eye region, this is the input algorithm is just this eye region and this is the reconstruction. So we can actually reconstruct this face from this periocular eye region and compare the original to this reconstruction. So, so you can see we're doing an amazing job reconstructing the whole face from just this periocular eye region. And we neutralize out expression and facial uh, hair. So that's pretty amazing going from here to here, from here to here. 
And there's no knowledge about ethnicity or gender or age in the input to the algorithm. The only input to the algorithm is just this periodical image. So in the time of COVID, we have research to be able to see how we can match individuals, even though all you're seeing is the periodical region. And here are some more results. Uh, where this is, again, the, the original face. This is the cropped out eye region from the original face. And this is our reconstruction. So compare this to this. KSVD was one of the compressing sensing algorithms. PSA is a textbook algorithm. We know it's going to fail. Both of these don't do well. So focus on, on our reconstruction, this, this row here, and the input row. So if you compare the two, in fact, if I gave you this image, you would have said, that's the same girl. You wouldn't have never have realized this is actually hallucinated from just this image. And it, it's very clear that the reconstructions maintain the ethnicity, the gender, even the age of the, of, of the reconstructions. Here is a video of uh, the matching happening. So this is just the periocular and we're able to show you the commercial matcher that we're, we're, we're showing the person matches in the top uh, 10 of a database of like 10,000. This is a demo in my lab of our facial recognition algorithm in action. This is an earlier version. This is a, expecting the whole face. There's only one image that was enrolled and, and there's no temporal tracking whatsoever. We're showing the raw frame to frame performance here. And every time it matches, it, it shows up the person and the timestamp. Now, I will show one more application of facial recognition and our facial detection technology. And in the area of privacy, um, biometrics can actually play a role in protecting privacy. And one of the ways that facial detection can work is we can actually blur out faces to ensure privacy uh, when certain folks do not want to be uh, tracked or in surveillance cameras. So here is a video that we processed where we're, we're actually uh, blurring out all the detective faces robustly, even if they're extremely off angle. So you can see that biometrics can play a role, not only in identification, but also to ensure and protect people's privacy. And there's different ways we can actually, we can blur out the face, we can put someone else's face there. Uh, a, what you do on the face really is, 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 a, is a business uh, rule that can happen. The main thing is we're showing that technology is able to robustly find and mask out the faces regardless. So uh, in, in the age of privacy, it, it is, these are important tools that can be used to, to help, help us. So with that, I, I conclude my, my talk and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, and Dr. Svides, I think we have a couple minutes for uh, a couple of questions. If we um, can pull a few from the chat, I'll, uh, I'll, toss, them, uh, I'll toss them out. Um, one questioner uh, raised, um, can contact lenses defeat iris recognition? Uh, it depends. Traditional ones that are, uh, you, you know, uh, we wear, no, they, they won't affect. But if somebody wears like a Halloween style contact lens where you're not seeing any part of the iris and you literally have this, it's me equivalently putting a brown bag over my, my, my face and saying, can I do facial recognition? I can't. But then there's things you can do at looking at liveliness. Am I seeing that there is the pupil is responding. Do I see anything changing there? If I don't, then I know somebody's just put a contact lens that just basically blocks out the iris and only, uh, you know, allows uh, the pupil to to for the person to see. Another question came up, uh, and maybe this is sort of the broader uh, facial recognition. Obviously, there have been concerns about racial dis disparities. What's been your experience from where you sit uh, and your work in terms of? Um, 
narrowing the gap or, or understanding how uh, there may be racial differences? Great question, and there have been, right? We've seen a lot of reports and even some earlier work from Google where some of the technology with facial detection did not work robustly across different ethnic groups. And that's where we really focus on AI to generalize beyond the data set. So part of solving this is making sure your data is equally diverse, but you can't always ensure that. So you have to build the robust AI algorithms that actually perform even though you have small sample data in particular classes. And that's why I focused on our facial detection. We saw whether we could find, I mean, in, in my data, there was uh, diverse uh, ethnicity, but not only that, occlusions, right? And that's the key thing I focus here at Carnegie Mellon. How can we build robust AI that generalizes beyond the training data? Because most of the work out there in the commercial and very, very startups, you know, it's, the entry to buyer doing AI is very simple. And unfortunately, most of the ready to pluck AI algorithms are not very smart generalizing. And we and AI ends up getting a bad rep because simple algorithms are being used. That's where the reason we do Carnegie Mellon here is able to show about generalizing beyond and making sure this issues of bias and, and uh, misrecognition of, of diversity are not things we deploy. One questioner has an interesting question. Given that uh, your algorithm is uh, achieving the blurring, uh, does that mean that um, you could use the algorithm to um, unblur? So could somebody with access to the technology um, uh, de deconstruct the blurring uh, to recreate the, the uh, faces defeating the privacy protection? Great question. So that's why I said I showed it's not one kind of blur there, right? You can actually black out completely the face, right? So what I showed is the result of us making sure we detect correctly, but how much of a blur you do, you can change. You could put a uh, smiley face, for example. So the, the, the answer is if you blur completely or leave no information, there's no reconstruction. We see, uh, uh, because of the advances in facial recognition, generally uh, efforts to legislate norms and boundaries for use by, by government, by commercial actors. Uh, one question, or, and obviously in, in some countries, Europe and elsewhere, uh, those legal structures are in place. Some cities are, are banning uh, use uh, by, by government agencies, uh, but we don't yet have a federal law. Hopefully we will uh, in the upcoming year uh, for privacy or, or for um, facial recognition. Um, one questioner asks, what's the state of commercialization of such uh, technology given that we don't necessarily yet have the legal regime in place to make sure that uh, you know, a private company or, or government agency uh, can't um, um, misuse the, uh, the, the technology? So I can tell you that working with law enforcement, and, you know, and, and, I, and I wanna say this something that I, I'm seeing because I sit on the fence, right? I see things from a privacy point of view, I see things from a law enforcement view, and I get to see things in law enforcement that many people don't. And it's scary because I think we as a society are jaded by Hollywood. Hollywood has done an amazing job of brainwashing us that uh, we live in a minority report world or in New York State world where this big brother and facial recognition is the bad. And if you step into any police department at any given time and you see how many unsolved crimes there are because there's an image of someone committed a crime and they don't have any facial recognition. They have no idea who it is. The person is scot-free and the officers don't even have a lead of what we investigate. And I think there has to be more education on the real implications of how much crime there is where this technology can actually protect society, help save lives and bring criminal actors to justice quick. And it, it is so sad that that is just uh, we need to do more to edu educate how useful and how badly this is needed to help society. And I think, again, we've been brainwashed by Hollywood that this is all very, very bad. And it's, we need to look at both sides of the fence objectively. Well, perhaps with an objective understanding of what's feasible and what the risks are and what the uses are, having a legislative structure in place that you know ensures that any of the concerns you know that there's there's recourse there's there's uh, oversight that it's being used 
um, you know, by democratic societies in ways that are, uh, you know, supported and, and uh, that the concerns for misuse or bias are, uh, but I suspect this is uh, to some degree what we will get into during the um, panel discussion um, uh, later. Um, I thank you. Uh, it's really fascinating to have a look at really the cutting edge of where the um, technology is going. And, you know, the, the reason it, it will be the cause of privacy debates, ho hopefully in a more sober way than sort of Hollywood driven uh, and including the, the, the folks who understand both the, the risks and the uh, benefits. Um, we are taking a um, short break now uh, for uh, 10, 15 minutes. So those of you who want to Bite can, can get a bite. Um, we are going to come back at 12.15 um, uh, sharp, uh, and uh, Lisa will then introduce our, um, our next uh, presenter. So thanks, everybody. Get up, stretch a little bit, and um, we will um, uh, give a little bit of a shout out at about 12.15 when we uh, come back. Okay, we're going to get started again. I am very excited to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Anil. Dr. Anil Singh's accomplishments in the fields of internal and pulmonary medicine are so vast and impressive that describing them in just a few minutes is really going to be a grave and a disservice to him. But for the sake of time, Dr. Singh holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Clinical Gerontology from Baylor University and a Master's of Public Health with an emphasis on disease control and epidemiology from the University of Texas Health Science. He attended medical school at Ross University and has completed his residency in internal medicine at Northeastern Ohio College of Medicine. He completed his fellowship in pulmonary medicine at our own Allegheny General Hospital, in addition to completing a master's of medical management from Carnegie Mellon University. As if that weren't enough, Dr. Singh developed and established a breathing disorder center and developed a care model for COPD in addition to serving as the clinical lead for a collaborative effort for lung transplantation and COPD Precision Medicine Center of Excellence with Johns Hopkins University and Allegheny Health Network. Most recently, he served as the system and division chair for pulmonary, critical care, allergy, immunology, and sleep at Allegheny Health Network, and is currently the executive medical director of clinical solutions, design, and implementation, as well as research and innovation at Highmark Health's enterprise clinical organization. As you can see, we could pick almost any subject in clinical care for Dr. Singh to address. But today, he's here to share with you the fascinating work he is doing in studying voice patterns of persons with coronavirus. With that, I give you one of the jewels in the crown of the Allegheny Health Network, my friend, Dr. Anil Singh. Thank you so much. Very kind. I'm, I'm certainly uh, extremely honored um, and excited to be talking to all of you about the work that we are doing. Um, and, and really what we're doing is, is really discussing a symptom monitoring tool, as well as screening for both acute and chronic respiratory diseases using voice. Um, and so I, I brought along a, a partner of mine that I've been working with for over a year and a half, um, who, whose name is Satya Venetti. Um, she's both a researcher and an engineer. She's got 18 years of engineering experience and has worked at, at Carnegie Mellon, <clears throat> where she created a machine emotional intelligence portfolio that was actually utilized by the Department of Defense. She's the co-founder and chief uh, technology officer uh, at Telling.ai, and, and we got to know each other about a year and a half ago when um, you know this voice uh, I, idea was was brought to me from from. Uh, an idea of how do we use this clinically? How can we incorporate this into clinical practice for the betterment of, of, a, of an 
almost about a million people really uh, worldwide that have uh, respiratory diseases. So with that, I'm going to have her um, briefly talk about the, the, um, the technical aspects of uh, uh, the, the voice technology, and then I'm going to tie in the clinical aspects of what we're actually doing um, in, in current states. So Satya. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm assuming that people can hear me. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for that introduction. Uh, what I'm going to do now is talk about a little bit about what we do and how we do it. So what we do at Telling.ai is voice-based symptom monitoring and screening for chronic and acute respiratory diseases. Uh, our solution can be deployed on mobile phones in real time and it works in the wild. So with our solution, we can provide affordable, non-invasive and fast respiratory care and monitoring for more than 1 billion people around the world who suffer from respiratory diseases. Um, so let's talk a little bit about exactly what we do. So we have an app uh, that can be deployed on your mobile phone. And we have a bunch of voice and breath prompts that we collect from people. It takes about two minutes depending on the application. And one of the first things we do is calibration because our, uh, our, you know, our app is going to be in the wild. We're going to be dealing with all kinds of noise profiles. So we have a calibration, which is about a five second recording where we ask the user to stay quiet and all we do is record their noise profile. And we use this in later prompts to actually subtract out the noise. And this is important because I'll show you later how we can't use regular denoising techniques and why it doesn't work for us. The second thing we do is we ask people to say a sustained syllable like, uh, you know, like when you go to your doctor's office. This is used to record, record maximum phonation time and it's shown to be strongly related to lung capacity. Next thing we do is we ask people to give a breathing prompt, take a deep breath, just like if you go to your doctor's office and they put, you know, they actually ask you to breathe in and out while they put a stethoscope on your chest. We listen to this because we can detect adventitious sounds. Adventitious sounds are abnormal sounds that occur on the airways and they can actually tell you, are they very indicative of underlying lung disease? We can also use a forceful exhale, which is actually used to you know, simulate a, um, a spirometric procedure to get FEV1, which is forced uh, expiratory volume in one second. We also ask people to read, uh, read a passage and we use this to examine things like dyspnea when you're speaking, phonation, prosody, and things like that. Um, So one of the things when you go to your doctor's office, your doctor is always trying to diagnose um, a difference from the baseline and they can just listen to you and talk to you for about five minutes and they know whether you're feeling better or worse or what's wrong with you. And what we are trying to do is automate that. So here I have what is called a spectrogram and it's really a visual representation of audio. On the Y axis is frequency, on the X axis is time. There's also another dimension called amplitude. So at any given point, at this frequency at this time, how bright this point is shows the amplitude of the signal. On the left-hand side, we have a diseased person and on the right-hand side, we have a normal person. And you can just see the difference visually how the diseased person is missing the higher frequencies, how they take longer to exhale and how the intensity itself is less. And this is what we automate. We want to find this automatically. I'm just going to play a sound and I hope you guys can listen to this, but this is the deceased person exhaling. And this is the normal person exhaling. And you can just hear the difference and what we're trying to do is teach the machine um, how to tell this difference. This is again, I think a very interesting movie and a slide that I have. So wheezing is an adventitious sound that is sort of musical in nature. And it typically happens when you know, patients have obstruction. And wheezing uh, is, um, it's like a whistle. And the frequency has to be above 100 hertz and it has to be at least uh, 100 milliseconds in length. This is from a COPD patient. This is raw audio. When I say raw audio, this patient went to a respiratory therapist's office to get a pulmonary function test. 
there was a machine in the office that emits a constant hum and we do we actually record it with the hum and i'll show you why that's important right now so this is raw audio this is not denoised and i'm going to play it hopefully you guys can see and hear it Sorry, uh, I'm going to go one step ahead. Give me one minute. Uh, I don't want denoised audio, I want raw audio. Okay, so now I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna play it one more time. Pay attention to the whistling noise at the end. This is the spectrogram where the person had the wheezing. And you can see these two lines over here. This is at a frequency of about 1.5 kilohertz. This is at a you know, frequency about three kilohertz. And you can see how long they are. And we can use these signatures in voice to actually look at the underlying you know, physiology and the pathology of the lungs. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the machine understand just by looking at these spectrograms and trying to use machine learning ideas to figure out, uh, to match these patterns to different diseases. Um, I did tell you about denoising. So there's a lot of denoising uh, standard ways of doing things. So if we were to denoise this audio and use, use the standard, you know, standard methods of denoising it, um, I'll play this for you and you can see what happens. So it sounds much cleaner, but the whistling noise itself has been suppressed and tamped down. That's because all the standard denoising techniques out there are meant or are optimized to deal with speech. So what they do is any sound like wheezing, et cetera, they actually suppress it. And that doesn't work for us because those are the sounds we need to look and figure out and figure out what's happening. So our, our proprietary techniques are able to use this, the first you know, like calibration prompt I talked about and subtract those from these other prompts. So that's how we do our denoising. We don't use all the standard techniques. We actually subtract out every person's unique noise profile. So these are some of the things we do um, and it's fascinating. And we've been doing a lot of very good work with Allegheny Health Network, which I think uh, Dr. Singh will talk about now. Thank you very much, Satya. Um, so, you know, again, uh, I think one of the things that um, is very important is, is we take that um, technology and, and the question is, is how then do we apply it to real world? And so one of the things we started to do about a year ago, a little over a year ago, is we, you know, one of the things we do in, a, in, a, in assessing patients uh, that come to see me, for example, with lung problems is we do something called a, a pulmonary function test. And really this is, um, this is really looking under the hood of the, of the patient and really assessing and testing the engine of the lungs. Um, so it gives us very discrete and very granular data. Tell me how well a person's lung function is doing, un maybe unbeknownst to the patient because the patient is going about their, their uh, everyday uh, business, if you will. Um, and so we use that as a, as a very important marker to determine different types of lung disease a patient may have, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or pulmonary fibrosis for that matter. And so what we did with, with, um, you know, with telling is that we said, let's, let's see and test, can the voice get down to that granular level of data? Can that tell me whether or not a patient is obstructed if they are restrictive, which basically means um, very stiff lungs, and, and can they get down to that level of detail that I need to know to say, well, what is their what Satya had mentioned before, which is their FEV1, which is the amount of air that a patient can exhale in one second. Um, and that, that really, if you think about it, when somebody takes a breath in as, as large as they can, they exhale out as hard and as fast as, the, as they can. The most amount of air comes out in that very first second. And we measure that. And um, after about 140 uh, or so patients, um, we, we actually saw a very strong uh, correlation with an R2 of about 0.8, which is very good and suggest that the voice can, in fact, detect um, to that level of granular detail a patient's lung function. Um, it was around that time as we were, you know, we, would re we were recruiting and recruiting and recruiting, and then all of a sudden COVID hit. Um, and unfortunately what happened is because doing that, performing that procedure is aerosol generating, 
um, because you're asking a patient to really blow out as hard as they, they, they can, um, it's not safe to do that without that patient being tested for COVID. So we had to shut down, um, for the most part, a lot of the operations as the rest of the country did, and we were very strategic in, in how we actually had patients go about that, that study. Um, so then during the era of, of, and I would say probably March, um, we started looking at and seeing what, what can the voice do in the setting of COVID patients. And so we set up another study um, at our institution that, that took patients that were really um, uh, sent for testing. And our goal was to determine, you know, if you had a patient that was a, had a positive test, what was their uh, longitudinal outcome and what did their voice, um, you know, do as far as that, that clinical change? And what I would say is that some patients that, that test positive for COVID, as I'm sure everybody uh, is aware of in the news, they have different courses. Um, some patients do fine. Uh, other patients struggle, but they may struggle at home. And then yet others will fall on the other end of that spectrum, which is they'll end up in an emergency room, a hospital, and in worst case would be an ICU. So if we could determine um, with the voice and have that patient, what I call deposit their voice samples um, in a, in a, uh, from the time that they tested positive all the way through their, their course, um, were there subtle changes that we could detect um, and, and really map uh, according to their clinical path? And we thought that that would be you know, very important. And, and you know, uh, fortunately, in, in Western Pennsylvania, um, you know, where we're at, the, the, the number of, of COVID positive patients were not that high. And we're very thankful for that. And so our numbers are still uh, being generated right now. But, um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're also, um, you know, hitting the winter months and we anticipate, uh, you know, another set uh, or another wave. So we are, we are excited to kind of see where, where that might take us. And, and then in addition to that, you know, a lot of the patients that have respiratory disease um, will exacerbate. And what I mean by that is that they will, they, their clinical course and their clinical sy symptoms will get worse. It can get worse for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one is non-compliant, so they're not taking their prescribed inhalers or medications. Others is they can get infected with a viral illness, um, the flu, a bacterial infection, pneumonia. Um, other patients can, and you know, air quality could be bad. Um, think about in California, where all of those uh, fires have taken place, that air quality is so poor that patients with respiratory diseases, when they breathe it in, that can get worse. And so the ability to then detect um, and predict uh, just through the voice um, you know, when a patient gets worse, that becomes very important clinically because then that can allow us to mitigate their disease process. Because once a patient exacerbates, it's the primary indicator for a recurrent exacerbation. And it really continues into a spiral type of effort where they end up in a hospital and ICU and their lung function ultimately declines almost permanently. So our job as, as clinicians dealing in this space is really to prevent them from ever having an exacerbation. So we really believe as a, as a focal point of our, as our ongoing um, relationship with telling that the voice is a, an important tool um, to help us uh, take care of patients with, with all sorts of respiratory diseases, all the way from, from you know, regular, uh, what I call regular asthma, COPD, all the way through COVID and, and different types of pneumonia. So we're really excited about that. I think that, um, you know, again, the, the studies that we've done so far have been uh, very promising. Uh, the lung function uh, piece is also very important because um, it takes normally about 45 minutes uh, to complete that study. Um, a patient has to come into a room. I told you that they're, you know, breathing heavily and, and they're being asked to, to blow out as hard and as fast as they can. And there's a, a respiratory therapist on the other end of that who's, who's basically getting the, 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 um, uh, the downstream effects of this. So if, if you can think about even a, a way of, uh, I would say, eliminating that test, but reducing the frequency and requirements of having that test and just using voice, uh, that, that is tremendously valuable for me as a clinician because now I have a baseline of, of what that patient's lung function is and not have to put them through that test. So there are uh, you know, tremendous applications to just using the voice um, in, in, in the scope of uh, a work that I do. So, so with that, I'll end. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. And again, thank you so very much for, for allowing us to, to participate in this uh, wonderful conference. Thank you. Super, um, in, uh, super intriguing. And uh, I'll uh, pull a question from the, um, from the chat. Um, if you could detect a disease on a phone call, 
you have a duty to inform the person making the call aware of the issue, or is that a consequence of privacy and security? So I guess um, maybe to generalize the question is uh, in, in the models that you've set up, somebody is particularly you know, participating and, and obviously is informed that understands what's, uh, what's going on. Um, I know we've heard, and maybe this is uh, um, science fiction or, uh, or maybe something that's um, uh, uh, still a limited, we certainly heard of um, uh, technologies being applied um, when people call into uh, call centers or other uh, areas where there's a big focus on uh, on that sort of information. Um, it, 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 is there application um, of this in a broader, or do you always have to calibrate and go through the you know the protocols for it to be effective? Um, is there sort of a mass use? Uh, I call my my doctor, and um, uh, while I'm making an appointment, uh, I'm uh, you know there's an observation made that I might want to pursue uh, you know further um, further testing or the like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably one of the, the more interesting questions that we've absolutely thought of, right? Um, because the number and frequency of phone calls that are being called into a doctor's office for a number of reasons for, you know, scheduling appointments to, you know, request test results um, and, and that recorded uh, message that may be left or in real time um, could, in fact, indicate that a patient could be, you know, experiencing some symptoms especially if it's in a predictive way. So if we, if we, as we are doing our studies, we find, and I'm making this up, but if we found that day three, if there's a signal in the voice, um, and we know in, in three days that patient will suffer an exacerbation, yes, the, the answer is we probably do have a duty um, to inform that patient and figure out what do we do next. And those are the things that we're actually working through um, uh, you know, as, as we're kind of going through those studies, uh, we still, we're still kind of early on on some of that. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that there is potential for global Im implications for this because, um, you know, uh, I, I think about it in, in patients that smoke um, and, you know, what's their lung function and are they, um, you know, are they close to having a, uh, an exacerbation or an attack? And if we were to, you know, intervene at a specific period of time before that, we can actually help preserve that patient's lung function. So it's, it's a very fascinating and interesting question that I think data and privacy will, will have to weigh in on. Yeah, I suppose if I walked into a medical professional's office or a waiting room and somebody behind the counter, whether they were a medical professional or a receptionist said, hey, that doesn't look good. You better have the doctor look at it. Obviously, somebody's making a sort of you know general assessment using some knowledge. Uh, and we, we probably wouldn't say, that's not your business. Don't, don't do that until somebody's, you know, in the room. On the other hand, what about the front door of the hospital? What about the lobby of your office uh, in a workplace? Uh, so uh, I, I guess what ends up being interesting about some of the biometric um, challenges uh, is the fact that they can be passively detected when I'm not in a clear, um, you know, medical, legal, ethical relationship. And when is that something that, you know, a, a hospital organization, uh, you know, like Highmark says, well, we, we've got people in the building and they've got the flu and we may know they have the flu, even though they may simply be a, uh, you know, a visitor um, or we can actually, you know, uh, alert you to more significant issues. Uh, and when is that uh, simply not, uh, you know, are we straining the uh, and expanding you know, the, the expectations of healthcare and the like. So uh, we'll, we'll take a note perhaps to um, capture that issue for uh, later discussion as well. I think we've got uh, time for uh, one more question. If anybody in the audience wants to either pop it in chat or you can even, uh, I think, raise your hand and our folks uh, will see it. And uh, if anybody on the panel, uh, 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 my colleagues has a, a question, I think we could... Um, Throw, uh, throw that in too. Let me know if we see anything. Uh, here we go. Um, is this a potential pretest for COVID? I guess we're talking respiratory. That's the obvious big, uh, big question. Do you, do you have any insights, any differences, COVID positive or non-positive uh, samples at this point? I mean, what I would, the way I would answer is we are way too early in that process to detect. Um, and to determine any kind of uh, uh, feasibility. Um, again, you know, what happened with us in Western Pennsylvania is the, the volume of positive patients were down. 
And then the other piece to this is it's very difficult to recruit. Um, and as you can imagine, you're coming through a testing center um, where everybody is in, in, in PPE. Um, and these are, these are pretty, you know, uh, have had masks and, and, and hazmat suits and different things like that. Um, and, and it's difficult to say as you're, you know, getting a swab, would you like to participate in the study? So what we've, we've had to do is, is really give out flyers and, and allow that voluntary participation. And as you can imagine, somebody who's maybe not feeling well has a packet of things. It, so, so we've struggled a little bit on, on that end on recruitment, but we believe that, um, again, as, as time goes on, as the positivity um, rates potentially um, go up, I think that, that there will be some uh, you know, ongoing interest. And we're collaborating with other institutions across um, the region to also increase those numbers. So I think I'll have a better, um, better insight once we get some more numbers. Um, you know, I, I don't know for sure whether the voice will tell me, is this COVID or not? Because I think it may be difficult to distinguish between uh, potentially other viral infections that may cause respiratory diseases versus other bacterial infections versus anything else. So I'm not sure if it will be that specific, but, but certainly we'll wait and see. I think the important piece of that is, is, the, is the longitudinal spectrum of how the patient's course will proceed. And it's whether or not some, you know, why is it that some patients do okay? Why is it some patients get sick but don't need hospitalized? And why is it that some patients are ending up hospitalized? And if you can, in, in a predictive way, determine which way or which path that patient is heading, the uh, ability to then intervene early could, could mitigate that um, progression, especially into the highest uh, acuity settings. Squeeze in one more from one of the FPF team here. Um, the smart home, uh, people are using a general um, phone here for this. Um, can, uh, can Alexa provide this skill at some point uh, or Google or any of the smart home speakers? Is this a future you know, ho home diagnosis or home, home remote testing? So that's the holy grail, right? You just say, Alexa, you know, and you ask something and Alexa says, uh, I think you're getting a cold, Jules. You may want to call your doctor. So that's the holy grail for us. But yes, it's definitely something we would love to work towards. Super. Uh, Laurie, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Vanity. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Anil and Satya. That was great. Um, we are going to now move on to our third and final technical presentation. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Yang Kai, who is the director of the Visual Intelligence Studio and a senior system scientist at the Scilab Security and Privacy Institute at CMU. Um, his research interests include artificial intelligence and augmented reality in real world applications, including healthcare, cyber physical security, privacy, and intelligence. He has authored two AI textbooks, and his team recently won first, the first place award in the NIST Haptic Interface Challenge, and has entered the final phase four of the NIST Chariot Augmented Reality Interface Challenge this year. So, uh, our third speaker. Thank you, Rolly. Um, today, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, almost two topics. One is start from a technical uh, description of uh, remote uh, fever uh, screen technology, and then we generalize uh, the problem into uh, privacy real design issues and policy issues. Uh, let me uh, go to the next screen. Um, Soma imaging or the infrared imaging is a medical, uh, actually is a medical device and uh, itself uh, uh, could be a biometric uh, um, sensor. For example, here's uh, my palm and uh, you can uh, see the veins through the thermal imaging and uh, that could be used for authentication. And uh, thermal imaging can also help us to see the patterns behind the skin. So right now I'm wearing a uh, a makeup mask. So uh, if I can uh, take off, uh, that's my real face. And um, through the thermal imaging, actually you can see um, the, uh, the face behind it. And uh, so you can uh, see, you know, the pattern uh, of the skin. And also this is my original skin and this is the, um, the uh, the skin with the, the mask. So you can see the pattern is uh, uh, kind of a different. And it's very easy to use uh, uh, 
uh, current pattern recognition uh, algorithm to detect uh, is somebody wear the mask and uh, uh, it's a fake face or is this a real face? So uh, this thermal imaging can really can uh, help us to see uh, better uh, than the visible uh, image. Uh, so here I want to uh, zoom in into our uh, current uh, technology for remote temperature sensing. And uh, uh, this can be applied to uh, uh, airport, a large gathering place. So we can do uh, fever detection uh, with the multiple uh, uh, sensors. So we can remotely to check the temperature to see if there's any uh, elevated temperature. That's one of the symptoms of uh, COVID-19. So we developed this system can uh, detect um, multiple person and we will start with the face tracking. And then we measure the distance of the target uh, to the camera and we do calibration based on distance. And I also calibrate uh, with uh, uh, different uh, temperature, ambient temperature. And uh, so uh, eventually we get to this uh, uh, fever uh, detection output. Uh, this design is, uh, um, uh, we tailored for uh, privacy and will uh, issue. So we don't really store the data or generate the data, uh, generate the face. So we generate a real time uh, location map so we can highlight uh, which uh, uh, um, a person has an elevated temperature and where the location dynamically. So we can actually have a security guard and to, to uh, intervene uh, the person uh, in the real time. So this device is very affordable. It's one tenth of commercial products and they have a, a similar quality. Uh, also can be embedded into the building security system and other uh, systems. So here is a, a short uh, documentary demo, and uh, this is uh, my assistant. The faces are detected in the RGB frame on the position of the forehead tract. The corresponding forehead temperature in the thermal frame is then calculated to check if there is a fever. The system is robust to facial obstructions, the likes of glasses and masks. The system can also track multiple people at the same time. The system includes temperature correction to improve its accuracy. Since heat will be lost in the environment as you move away from a thermal camera, our depth um, camera helps correct for this. We can also measure a reference temperature manually and correct any thermal offset there might be. Uh, further applications for the system could include a drive through application or also working outdoors. And this would help detect people with a fever before they enter a building. Okay, so uh, we um, uh, had a, a several requests from industry and also from government and uh, um, to explore this uh, feasibility for affordable, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fever screening in the public uh, space. And um, then we uh, actually, since uh, March, we uh, collected the local uh, data for Allegheny County uh, COVID-19 data, and uh, this population is uh, about 1.2 million uh, people in Great Pittsburgh area. So we can see this uh, um, trend. Uh, uh, March and April, we have uh, the first wave, and uh, after June, we have the second wave. And uh, you can see, supposedly, this is uh, through the modeling, um, the pandemic modeling, and, and it should be very close to uh, uh, normal distribution, but uh, you can see it has a long tail, uh, it just has equilibrium and uh, it, it stay there for a long time. So, so we predict it will glide to a very long time. And um, this is because, uh, you know, individually we're not really complying, you know, this uh, uh, public safety uh, uh, guidance and uh, still have, uh, a, you know, a lot of uh, social interactions. And, uh, 
So what we anticipate is this uh, remote sensing um, capability is try to uh, prevent super spray events, super uh, um, uh, spray with infectious uh, person. But unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, uh, percentage, you know, about 30% of patients, they don't have a, a symptom. It's called like pre-symptomatic -symp uh, uh, period. So this window, um, perhaps other sensor will be uh, more useful, for example, smell, lost smell and taste. taste. And this pre symptom and, uh, and after they you know, incubate for a week or so or two, and then become a very, very uh, uh, symptomatic, and for example, elevate uh, temperature and uh, uh, more, other uh, uh, lung uh, function problem and uh, more uh, visible uh, and also detectable. And uh, so this period is um, the area we are looking for because that's the most contagious period. So uh, we're still developing and to see how do we combine with the other sensors to uh, prevent the super spray. And this also, uh, linked to the privacy issue because uh, we are very care about uh, privacy in public uh, data uh, arena. So uh, we uh, look into this uh, visual privacy issues uh, carefully. And um, since uh, even 1960s, and uh, um, the visual privacy has been, you know, in uh, uh, well discussed. And uh, this is a diagram in the bottom, is a 1960, uh, 90, 1996. You can see the um, uh, privacy issue to the distance. So uh, the privacy actually change over distance because they have an intimate space and personal space, social space and public space. And now today we have a more complicated um, privacy space. Uh, from satellite to drone to peer camera to GPS to um, building CCTV to Bluetooth to shoes to uh, glasses. And uh, so, so privacy issues change over time and also privacy is a uh, contextual. So here is, um, uh, I have this uh, uh, sensor for thermal imaging. So the thermal imaging you saw from previous uh, slides uh, I talked uh, about uh, myself with uh, uh, the mask, and uh, you can see um, I checked it. In order, it goes to go to the server, and um, and I can plot uh, the the map uh, where I took the picture in, in Pittsburgh, and then I zoom in, and you can see that's my house and uh, uh, my home. So, so it's an invasive design in, in most many uh, commercial products. And uh, so there's no need for SIC, uh, the company called SIC, uh, a thermal imaging company, and why they want to store my uh, thermal imaging uh, in a map, you know, your geo uh, location. It can only, it's a setting in the uh, iPhone, and there's a, a geo location, uh, do you permit? Seek to access to it. So if you switch off, then there will be uh, no GPS coordinates. But again, if you don't really check carefully, and they will be uh, automatic to store your data. And when you take the picture, and uh, where the location is, and this is over uh, invasive. On the other hand, the privacy in crisis. I think this is a topic we want to discuss today. Is how do we deal with privacy in crisis during like the Wi-Fi uh, during COVID-19? And uh, uh, as the news said, uh, September 8th uh, this year uh, in California, uh, about 12 people died. Most people, uh, senior people, uh, that they die in the car and the roadway try to escape. But there's no way we can uh, uh, contact them and they have no uh, uh, GPS uh, uh, alert, go to the authority, go to the uh, fire uh, station. So they just die in the cars. And it is very tragic, tragic, you know. So the privacy is dynamic and uh, 
uh, it's a function uh, linked to the risk assessment and also the cost to do uh, the privacy uh, protection. So in normal time, I would say peaceful time, so we definitely need to protect the privacy data, uh, the data privacy and also you know, security safety. But during the crisis, OS uh, status, we do need to, uh, to change the settings and also make sure that this uh, GPS location and uh, uh, vital data could be uh, visible to the uh, first responders. And then after this situation, after this uh, crisis, we have to recover. We have to resume the privacy protection and the recovery phase is very critical. So this period, the window for crisis is we have to assess, are we under the amity far? Because if in the war zone, we still don't want to expose our position. But if we're not really in enemy far, so we have to really uh, uh, to, to, to change our uh, privacy for a very small window. And it turned out the public has very uh, good uh, trade-off decision-making uh, process during the crisis. So we did a, a study to, to see the TSA screening and uh, we tried different way to blur the image, to increase the transparency of the image of the 3D model and to test the male subjects and female subjects. And we asked questions during the normal time, for example, alert color is green or the alert color is the red or, or yellow. So what do you change the priority of privacy? So it turned out uh, during the crisis, we ask if the security color is red and it turned out people intend to uh, lower their privacy uh, requirement and um, uh, intend to do more revealing uh, pictures is fine. It turned out the female subjects uh, have more tolerance uh, than the male subjects. It's uh, pretty interesting. You can see the number for female uh, during normal and during crisis, uh, the into, go to the left side instead of the right side. So it's very interesting uh, discovery during the crisis, how the people respond to the privacy issues. And we actually can design some privacy aware uh, product. For example, that's the, the autonomous train. I uh, be a part of a team uh, in deployed in Singapore, downtown uh, Singapore at uh, light rail transit systems. Uh, the train will go past the residential area and you can actually to see uh, people's living room, bedrooms, so, you know, just 20 meters away. So uh, this team actually designed a mist window. So when the train goes through the prior, uh, this residential area will mist automatically. So you block the view, uh, then uh, just a few seconds and it will come back to the transparent. So it's a very graceful um, design. So we avoid the privacy outcry uh, from the public. So the local government and the local residents is very welcome this future and it doesn't cost too much money to implement. And a local transportation management center, for example, this uh, Prince of Prussia uh, transportation center and also we visited the District 11 uh, transportation center. They have a wide, um, broad uh, CCTV video wall, but they don't store the data. The reason they don't store data is, you know, first of all, protect privacy and also reduce their workload. Because if they store data, the government will subpoena the data and they don't have enough resources to go to the court every day. So that's called a low risk design. And also we can fix the data leaky or invasive uh, uh, problem at the source side, you know. Um, here is an um, uh, endoscope lab in McCandless, and um, uh, we want to record the colonoscopy video. And then uh, this video will contain the patient's information, birthday and, uh, um, and also private information. So we uh, can do post-processing to remove that, for example, OCR and other uh, 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 image processing. However, 
the nurse just stop by and <laughs> the nurse just tell us there is a switch behind this uh, colonoscopy machine and all you needed to do is just switch off. So if we switch off uh, during the recording, so there's no uh, personal information will be stored. So it's just a switch. Finally, I like to talk about this transformation uh, issue. Is um, uh, we see the trained uh, patients will have uh, more uh, access to their own data. For example, this is a CT data and the MR data uh, of myself. So I request every time I do the test, I request my data, and uh, most of hospital uh, labs uh, they. Uh, allow me to have the data, they just give me a CDs. So actually I can use open source to see my data and also can discuss with the doctors. For example, I um, ask a doctor, go to this UPMC doctor to look at my MI uh, scan. And uh, so he uh, was able to uh, go back to 12 years ago, the scan of my brain and compare uh, um, uh, recent scan and the 12 years ago the scan and he might uh, he, he was able to, to spot some changes and some uh, subtle things so we actually can predict a lot of things and then I go to the sleep lab so actually this is myself wired for sleep it turned in the lab in UPMC sleep lab I cannot sleep I only have uh, one hour sleep in the lab so it's not really realistic if you want to do a sleep uh, uh, test experiment uh, in the hospital. Uh, it would be more natural if you can do the test at home. So it took me two months to get my data because uh, um, UPMC has never really given patient uh, 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 data, sleep lab data. And they have to go through the lawyer office and. Uh, go through multiple uh, um, paperwork processes. And eventually I pay uh, 57 cents to get a CD. And eventually I have this uh, um, sleep lab data. So I can do a lot of study uh, for myself. Um, recently I did a pill camera with self-diagnosis from home. And uh, I uh, um, get a uh, second uh, test. Uh, from, uh, insurance uh, uh, eventually they agree to um, to cover this because it's much cheaper than the regular um, procedures for endoscope and uh, the cost for a pill camera actually is only like $250 but I also have a lot of uh, sensors involved so this is the pill camera I used and uh, um, I was uh, walking in the clinic office and I can drive to home and uh, eventually return the sensor. So after I did this uh, for eight hours and I can download um, this uh, video of the kill camera and I can use the, um, the software to view it. So I actually found the symptom one week before uh, my GI doctor informed me in the report. So you can do a lot of self-diagnosis at home and it's very private. And uh, so that's why I request, request uh, the second uh, pill camera test at uh, my home during, during this uh, pandemic because I make a good case. It's much cheaper and safer uh, do it at home than in the hospital. The future is here. Uh, the continuous monitoring at home with uh, safety, care, and uh, privacy and uh, we shall uh, look into this uh, trend. And this is a, a CGM, the Continuous Glucose Monitoring. I just ordered and uh, uh, actually I pay myself. Uh, insurance company actually doesn't really pay for this uh, glucose monitoring stuff. And uh, this have uh, continuous for 14 days and I have 24 seven um, uh, monitor of the data and I can collect all the data and I also do, you know, machine learning to AI with this uh, in uh, private settings. And uh, I won't uh, store the data in the crowd, so uh, nobody can access the data except me. And uh, also on the right, the thermal image of the need. And uh, so I can monitor and work with my fitness coach. I can uh, monitor the, the need problem and uh, to see the circulation issues. 
and assess the results before and after. So this is a, a kind of an issue. You move from the data from hospital, from centralized data crowd into private, distributed, home, and mobile, and also uh, embedded systems. And uh, I put a lot of uh, um, this experiment results into my book. Uh, it was published in 2014 and I published again for the soft cover in 2019 last year. And I'm going to uh, work on the second edition because the sensor is changing and uh, it become a very affordable to private uh, citizens. And you can actually do it at home without, you know, go to the clinic. Uh, the metaphor of this technology is your um, pre pregnant test kit. So for $6, you can go to Walmart and buy a pregnant test kit and without even go to the lab. And it's 99.9% .9 accuracy. And uh, so it become a very uh, uh, known, uh, very popular uh, test kit. And it, now you can do a lot of uh, other tests uh, for glucose, for blood pressure, for uh, oxygen level. Uh, for COVID-19, uh, oxygen level is very critical. You know, the President uh, Trump actually um, has uh, the oxygen level is below 96%. So it's pretty uh, high alert. So you want to continue to monitor this. And um, I also published a book called Instant Computing. So there's one chapter about visual privacy. And uh, I stated uh, the privacy is a vulnerability. And if you can eliminate those vulnerabilities, then you can solve a lot of headaches um, in privacy, for example, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, healthcare issue, uh, the privacy issue is because the pre-existing conditions and a lot of insurance companies don't really uh, cover the pre-existing condition. So if we eliminate those uh, pre-existing condition uh, uh, issues, then you know, a lot of privacy issues could be, uh, disappear, could, could just uh, disappear. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you for Thank you, Dr. That's uh, phenomenal and fabulous and, and quite interesting. Um, let me squeeze in a quick question before we uh, break. Um, um, the thermal uh, scanning, um, there's been debate for those of us who've been focused on the, the COVID issues around um, how accurate um, these are when they're done at a distance. Um, can they actually detect you know, normal temperature to, you know, slightly raise that risk uh, temperature, number yes. number one. Yes. Uh, the examples you gave were, uh, at least the, the, the models we saw were sort of all lower temperatures. And let, let me then add to that also, um, there is a range of reasons why somebody can have an elevated temperature, obviously beyond yeah. COVID. Um, uh, some of the concerns that uh, people have had about relying on this is that, uh, you know, you'd be uh, you, you'd be flagging a wide range of people who might simply have jogged to work, be pregnant, or, or yes. other. Uh, so, welcome your thoughts on that. Yes. So we test uh, with elevated temperature with uh, like hot, uh, you know, uh, 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 tower on the forehead, and then we measure with a thermometer, and uh, the temperature accuracy in the indoor condition is about half uh, Fahrenheit or less. Even uh, you know a quarter of a Fahrenheit to half of Fahrenheit, so this is a, a pretty close to the commercial product, and our price is extremely low. And because we just what use what is that? How how far distance away? Uh, about fourteen meters, fourteen meters. So this is uh, actually limited by face recognition and face um, the 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 RGB sensor uh, limitation. But if we can extend this. Uh, um, uh, uh, detection algorithms and actually it could be even longer and uh, because we did this from individual engineers home and uh, so we haven't really tested in a larger scale because our building was you know restricted to assess and uh, but again um, this is just one of the the uh, biometric uh, indications but we can actually do more testing, including, you know, other uh, uh, measurements. And um, uh, yeah, definitely you have a good point about, you know, because human uh, temperature is very complex and even the location, you know, 
uh, eyes and nose and uh, forehead. The different location might have different readings. And, um, and do you have a view on the question of the effectiveness of temperature screening for, for COVID, just given the, the range of um, reasons why somebody might have an elevated temperature? Uh, the reason uh, that's pretty complicated because in, even in our building, we do have some uh, enthusiastic for biking and for juggling. And when they come back and they're sweating and it definitely is very um, uh, elevated temperature and even elevated heart rate and the breathing pattern could be uh, uh, different. So this is more about people uh, exit airport, uh, exit uh, airplanes and uh, assume nobody will really, you know, cycling or running uh, away from the airport, uh, from, from the, from the, from the um, airplane. And uh, it's more like you commute to the office and get into the office. So, so uh, those kind of measurements, they do have a lot of um, assumptions. So we have to really carefully to use it. We even didn't really deploy, but we have a request from multiple um, entities. So we have to, uh, we just prove the concept. We can do it to deploy in a really uh, uh, efficient way. And uh, there are two modes can uh, deploy. One is uh, stationary. We can put on a tripod and people can uh, walk through. And another deploy is on the helmet for first responders. When they go into the patient's home when they do, and they can do assessment of heart rate, breathing rate, and uh, uh, oxygen uh, uh, level, and also the temperature. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're at time. Uh, really fascinating work. And again, uh, I think we've heard from all the panelists issues that are complicated, hard. You see the value. Certainly, they're going to raise societal and policy issues, and we will take them on. In, uh, let's take 10 minutes. We were gonna wrap at 105, we're about five minutes behind. So uh, let's uh, give you, however, a, um, uh, a 10 minute uh, break as, as, um, as we anticipated. So at 120 sharp, we will um, convene and I'll be joined by uh, a number of our colleagues from the uh, law policy side and we'll get into some of the uh, really interesting challenges uh, and see if we can work with you all to uh, flesh out some of the ideas. So. Thank you. We'll be back in uh, 120 exactly. We, we can look at that even if we just look simply at, at, at HIPAA, right, which is what everyone typically associates with, with healthcare. Um, you know, we are, we, we are evolving from what we looked at, you know, protected health information to really looking at, in, in many ways, physical privacy as well, because um, the, the, what, we're, what we are typically used to dealing with, which is information about the person and their body, has, has become almost um, informatized, if you will. In other words, the, in, the information is now, the body itself becomes the information, right? So, so for the last couple of decades, we're accustomed to dealing with data and, and elements that, com that comprise uh, the, the protected information. And now we're actually looking at really the core of what it means to be human. Some of these things that we're dealing with are actually the body itself as I said, becomes a source of information. So that's a challenge for us in the current framework that, that we've built over the last couple of decades since, since HIPAA became our, our guiding light, if you will. 
Um, even the, the time-tested controls that we have in place are really geared to looking at data itself, not the body as a source of information. So that, that is a challenge. And, and so when we look at these things, we look at, of course, the law, which is the rule book that we use, our desire, which is the far end of the spectrum, and then that gap in between, which is if the law doesn't address this, how do we still, how do we decide how we handle this, what we use, how we store it, et cetera. So, so compliance alone really isn't enough, even if there were regulations. We have to, to go a little deeper, and that's where I think the ethics comes in, right? And, and, and having an ethical framework, a governance framework, um, understanding how we decide how and when um, and, and where, if you will, we use these biometrics techno biometric technologies. And I think it was Dr. Kai's presentation that, that referenced that, that trade-off, right? So we look at that as well. We looked at that particularly with COVID. You know, you have the purest privacy perspective, and then you have this need, and biometrics really is addressing some of that need. And then we have to find that spot in between and say, what is the trade-off? right, for us to, to, with respect to privacy, and, and, and how do we address that? So for us, you know, we have a rather robust governance process, which I'm very proud of, and, and we are, as we look at um, the, the governance around the uses of this type of information, um, we, we also apply different principles that are not just legal theories, but they are ethical principles. So it's the combination of those two. Um, and there's also security issues with that too. Um, you know, biometrics are not something that if they're lost, they can be reset like your password. And, and we do use those for multi-factor authentication. So, you know, there's that consideration as well. So I'll just pause there because we could probably fill a day with this. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to bring in, uh, you know, Laurie, I, I was looking at the uh, range of backgrounds of the attendees and, you know, we've got this mix of sort of the law and policy folks and you, we've got people uh, who come from sort of uh, healthcare systems and healthcare providers and, and then obviously, you know, technologists at, at the privacy conferences that we spend a good chunk of our time at, somebody might have presented a slide or two or typically a headline or two or maybe a movie clip or two, you know, reminiscent of some of the technologies heard and everybody in the room would sort of gasp and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, see it as uh, you know, doom, and here's the danger that the world is going into. And here we have the opportunity to, you know, grapple with folks who are pushing the academic, you know, pursuit of knowledge, um, and also seeing applications for, for good, for social value. Um, and so we can't sort of just sit back and say, well, oh my God, look at that, that happens, we better be ready for it. it it's here, and we've got the right people, uh, so it's time to be uh, ready for it. So we, we, um, we heard about a variety of biometrics technologies. What privacy concerns did you see raised and what are some of the approaches um, that might be uh, used to address them? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's interesting in the healthcare space when we talk about biometrics, it's a little bit different conversation. Um, normally when we think about biometrics, we're just thinking about identification and authentication and you know, some of the things that, that Mario showed us um, with the face recognition. Um, and, and we do that in healthcare too. I know when I go to my doctor, um, there's now a kiosk where I check in instead of talking to a person and I put my finger on it and it identifies me and pulls up my records. Um, so, so we are using biometrics for, for those sorts of purposes. Um, but I think some of the really interesting things are to be able to actually um, uh, get patient data and to use it for, for diagnosis. Um, and that's very different than the, um, than the authentication uh, task. And I think, you know, with authentication, um, you know, we're worried about the data falling into the wrong hands and we're worried about authenticating and identifying people who don't want to be identified. Um, when we're looking at, um, at diagnosis, if it's a patient who has presented themselves to a doctor, then, you know, they want to be identified, they want to be diagnosed. Um, and I think the, the privacy concerns right there in that moment may be fairly minimal. Um, but then if the doctor then takes that and says, hey, I want to share this for research purposes, um, the question is, you know, can we de-identify that data enough um, uh, so that that can be done. Um, and then some of the questions that were raised, like, all right, so now that we can perhaps diagnose people from their voice or from the temperature of their forehead as they're walking down the street, um, can we just 
put this technology on every phone line or you know have have um, uh, cameras everywhere to, to do this diagnosis well now we have the problem of people who were not in a situation where they were expecting to be diagnosed and um, and so what sort of um, notice, consent, buy-in, uh, do we get from people in those situations? Uh, one of the favorite exercises I like to do with the students in my class is we talk about, you know, what if we put smart toilet technology in public restrooms, right? We now have technology that can measure your output in the toilet and, and for various clinical purposes. And when that's in your hospital room or whether that's when that's in your home, that's one thing. But what if we make that available in public? Um, that certainly raises a lot of very interesting privacy issues. Um, and there, you know, it's a range of technology. If we put it in every toilet and every flush, it's very different than what they're doing right now at some universities in the dorms where they're measuring the output for the whole building. And they've been able to successfully determine that somebody in the building had COVID. Then they go back and they test everyone in the building. Um, that's much less privacy invasive than if they were actually monitoring every toilet in the building. Um, so I, th I think, you know, we have kind of a range of concerns and a lot of it depends on the details of how we're deploying, what data we're collecting, who's keeping it, how long they're keeping it. Uh, Jules, you're muted. Wouldn't be a webinar if there wasn't at least. <laughs> um, it's perhaps a slippery bathroom floor, though, from measuring the output at a building to maybe a nursing home or a senior center where it might be very efficient to do it by floor or by room or by uh, or so forth. So certainly um, um, having the framework in place um, to help shape these is going to be uh, critical. Um, let me bring in um, uh, Rachel. Um, uh, so from a equity, safety, and fairness lens, Rachel, um, how do you see biometrics as being useful? And then how do you perhaps see them as a risk, especially for populations who might be at special risk of harm uh, because of uh, misuses of the technology? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I, I largely echo uh, both Lisa and Lori on this front where I think a lot of, given that a lot of the controversy around biometric technology implementation and use, it really rests on its scientific validity and also a guidance around responsible use. So um, take for example, uh, facial recognition technology where its accuracy is variable among individuals or populations with uh, varying skin tones. Um, if, if entities like governmental agencies or law enforcement, or even uh, in healthcare settings, if action is taken based on inaccurate match rates um, due to skin color, um, inaccurate rates uh, that are, might be inherent to facial recognition technologies or other kinds of um, technologies that rely on, on um, skin color as, a, as an indicator, um, harm might be done. If, if that technology is used and relied on um, without proper scientific evidence to validate the claims that, to which the technology is making. So um, I think it's really important to invest in um, validation studies that can produce more conclusory evidence that uh, is not necessarily um, uh, of consequence from a broader society or a personal um, standpoint but could definitely contribute to generalizable knowledge. And I think that gives us the time and space that we need to validate the claims, again, that the technology makes and make sure that individuals aren't harmed um, by any conclusions that uh, might be drawn based on data collected from these technologies. Uh, and also, uh, it's as Lisa mentioned, I, I think it's incredibly important to develop privacy and non-discrimination policies in tandem. Um, these policies should, should have technical, foundational, and ethical guidance, um, and also technology use limitations, just to make sure that individuals, especially those who uh, move around, move along the growing patient-consumer spectrum that we see, um, really to make sure that um, even in healthcare settings where um, harm and discrimination is rampant, uh, in many cases, make sure that these individuals who um, use the technology or are subject to it are not harmed as well as um, ensuring protection for entities and individuals like physicians and healthcare systems using the technology, protecting them um, from, uh, from liability, um, 
from making decisions based on this technology. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I, again, I largely echo Lisa and Lori on this front, and this is really what comes to my mind when I think about um, the broader societal and ethical implications, especially for vulnerable populations, um, that are subject to the deployment of these technologies across various settings like healthcare. Thanks, and Kirk, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, legislators um, perhaps reading science fiction novels, watching movies, or, or seeing concerns about you know, law enforcement deployment of facial recognition and, and so forth um, have already put laws on the books. There's a several billion dollar judgment, I think it's an appeal, I don't recall where it stands right now, uh, against Facebook in Illinois for facial recognition and scanning your social media photos. So, you know, the, the stakes are high. There are biometrics proposals across the country. Um, as somebody counseling uh, clients of every sort and healthcare and so forth, what, what, what prism do you bring to uh, what's happening on the legislative front here? Sure. I think in some ways, this is a perfect microcosm of the bigger debate that we're having on privacy just in general, which is, you know, most, most people, obviously the people in the privacy space know this, others may not. I mean, in the United States, we have regulated on a either a sector specific basis or particular practices. And so we have HIPAA, we have gram leach Bliley for financial institutions, we have particular laws dealing with marketing and things like that. Other countries, Europe in particular, they have these one size fits all laws. And one of the real challenges we have today is to figure out for each of these individual technologies, are we going to try to regulate, legislate in connection with a specific category of data with or without a particular sector? Or are we going to try to do something that is more general than that? And even when we start to think about this topic of biometrics, and this is something both in your question, Jules, and, and some of the earlier comments, I'm not even sure we treat all the biometric information the same. I mean, the, the, the risks and concerns of facial recognition are probably different than the risks and concerns related to fingerprints, which are also different than the risks and concerns related to genetic data. And so what we have is really this big picture question about whether we're going to regulate and legislate generally or specifically. Now, uh, Lisa identified some of the gaps that we're starting to see with HIPAA, where HIPAA does not apply to all kinds of health information that's generated outside of covered entities. We don't have that problem under GDPR that regulates all of the information regardless of where it is. But at the same time, GDPR doesn't have any specifics dealing with any of these individualized either sectors or particular kinds of information. Compare that to the HIPAA rules where, you know, you may disagree with some of the choices, but they designed a system that works really well for the core elements of the healthcare system. They've got all these trade-offs built in. They made lots of particular judgments. Um, and so we get, a, we, we, we get a very specialized attention to that particular practice, but that's going to be something we have to choose, right? Where you, you mentioned, Jules, some of the state laws that are coming up. We are certainly seeing state laws that are specific to things like facial recognition and biometrics. Also things like location data and various other particular kinds of data. At the same time, we're seeing CCPA kinds of laws, which purport to be generally applicable privacy laws. Although, let me footnote, if you're a California resident today, your health information under CCPA is actually subject to at least six different regulatory frameworks, which makes no sense if you're a consumer. It also makes no sense if you're a business, but you know, we've got that choice. And so I think the, the big picture question is how are we in fact going to regulate this data? We've got two parallel trends. We, we absolutely have at the state level specific laws that are being introduced for specific data those are actually tending to be easier to pass. The more general state privacy laws we're finding are harder to pass. At the federal level, where they're not passing anything, um, there are a handful of information-specific laws. What we're seeing is more of an effort to pass general privacy laws, which, which I think may be on the whole where we're more likely to end up, but at the same time, we're gonna lose all the subtlety that we have with HIPAA or that we have in particular settings where there are particular risks associated with particular data. I do think there's a big picture value judgment for us, which is how granular do we expect our legislators and regulators to be? I personally would not be thrilled if Congress tried to pass a general privacy law that also had subcategories on every kind of information that we could think of, 
because I'm not sure they do a very good job about with that. And so I think, again, this, this is a huge big picture question for the future of privacy. We're going to be figuring it out over the next I've been saying next four years over the next presidential administration, really whoever the president's going to be. But these core issues as technology is advancing and as these risks are growing is front and center, first tier component of that issue. But at the same time, I don't think it's being give, been given enough attention because the focus of the debate has been on other kinds of issues, preemption, private, private cause of action, rather than actually substantive important issues about what we're going to do with particular kinds of data. So it seems clear that um, in many of the proposed bills, in the leading you know, federal bills uh, in Washington state and so forth, biometrics generally is being called out um, as sensitive data, as special category data, uh, for which you need to get some type of individual confirmed commission, uh, permission from the individual. Um, are there challenges? Does that solve our problem? Or are there challenges created around how you define some of this? So let me take a COVID related example since we've got um, uh, experts on temperature here. Um, it wasn't clear immediately whether or not some of the European regulators were going to treat thermal scanning or uh, taking temperatures one by one, even without identifying people by name or so forth, but whether taking the temperature um, or taking the temperature of sort of a, a group of people was personal information. Um, it looks like mm, some decided it wasn't and things went on. Others decided that it is because I'm, I'm stopping somebody. I've got you know a person who I've singled out, even if I don't know their name, and I'm pinning a temperature to them. So it, it seems like there's some gray there. Um, so one of the challenges that we see with defining biometric is that these are also pieces of information that we are giving off passively as we walk past cameras, even if I haven't applied any sophisticated algorithm. Um, my temperature is being you know, given off. A, temperature, a, a thermal scanner can detect it. Uh, Facebook may or may not have thought that they were, you know, involved in facial recognition when they were doing some of their, you know, grouping or linking of photos. And, and there have been lawsuits against um, some of the companies that, you know, organize albums or, you know, the uh, school yearbook type activity. So I wonder whether, and, and uh, uh, I, I speak to Alexa, they have my voice, they may or may not be running, um, they are running, running speech detection, but whether or not that becomes a voice biometric. So I want to put out for, for any and all of you this notion of, you know, biometric becomes sensitive, regulated, express permission. And yep, this is actually something that we are displaying in public, touching, leaving behind. Uh, is it clear when this is personal and when this is not personal? Jules, let me jump in on some of that, which is, I mean, you talked about categorizing it as sensitive data. Think about GDPR. GDPR categorizes health information as sensitive data, but also categorizes religious affiliation, sexual preference, you know, whether you're a union member and things like that. Those all may be sensitive, but boy, the trade-offs and challenges and issues are totally different for those kinds of issues. And one of the things we face in the healthcare industry is all of the affirmative societal reasons that we want to use some of this information. And that may be increasing in a COVID environment, but it certainly is relevant for medical research and things like that. We can't even, you know, we, we may not even say something like, like a fingerprint that, that is used to identify when you go to the public library to check out a book. We may have a totally different set of issues there than if we're going to use that to connect to your medical records and use it for all the research. So my concern about lumping it even with sensitive data is that, 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 don't, that that's sort of a cop-out at some level. I mean, it's, it doesn't address the complicated balances that, again, I think the HIPAA rules do really well, but most of the other privacy laws that we have don't really do that other than through a consent mechanism. And, uh, you know, people in the privacy area obviously know the limits of the notice and choice idea. I just think that gets really hard and, and, and I think even ineffective if what we're talking about 
some of these particularly important issues for where, where the balances are much more complicated. Dr. Kai, I wonder your thought on is a thermal uh, digital readout unique to an individual or if I have a couple of them, you know, uh, it, it, uh, is there some reason to argue that a thermal scan is a unique uh, identifier, a unique uh, piece of information to one individual? Uh, yes, uh, there was a study about uh, the uh, the patterns of uh, the skeletal and uh, the temperature distribution. However, uh, the the temporal temperature measurement itself is not biometric. For example, you detect the dynamic uh, uh, fluctuation of the temperature. It's not really biometric, but the facial distribution of the temperature, um, it, it could be uh, biometric. Uh, there's uh, quite a few uh, papers study about how to really detect face, face, facial recognition through the thermal graphic. Um, and also, uh, uh, this human temperature as a species, it's a decline because we uh, get used to uh, air conditioning systems. They turn out to uh, actually impair the new systems. Um, the air average temperature is decline. Enhancing technology. Yes, yes, actually. Hey, Jules, it, it may also lead into one of my favorite parts of CCPA, which is including in the definition of personal information, olfactory information. So we're going to we're going to connect your 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 smell to being personal information. I haven't quite figured out where that's going actually. To be. Dog is very good, and actually, there's a yeah. lot of a study uh, to study the dogs, and they actually uh, pretty effective. One hundred percent actually is stunning. Uh, they sniff the COVID nineteen, uh, sniff the uh, uh, lung cancer, and uh, the computer and uh, today's uh, um, our sensors not as, as, uh, as sensitive as dogs. Yeah. Thoughts from any of you on some of the issues that were raised as we were walking through the different presentations around face, around voice, um, anything that particularly sort of, you know, triggered a, a you know, a particular concern uh, or a reaction that, that uh, you, uh, any of you want to comment on in particular? Yeah, Jules, I, I want to go back to the uh, thermal imaging um, topic. So we talked a little bit about this in a blog we published earlier. Um, this year about thermal imaging and its uses uh, to diagnose or uh, indicate uh, the presence of COVID. Um, so in, in our blog where we talked about this, we noted that the FDA, uh, in fact, um, discourages uh, uses of thermal imaging outside of medical settings, um, mainly because thermal imaging itself has been validated only in clinical settings, but not in in public settings, for example, like in airports or other high traffic areas. Um, and so for that reason, I think as we think about how um, biometric data collected under thermal imaging um, processes are treated under laws like GDPR and CCPA, we also have to think about some of the other regulatory aspects that have been um, aspects and also um, guidance that has been put out by uh, regulatory agencies like the FDA um, concerning the use uh, across various contexts. So I think context matters. And it's, um, it's really important to think about how the data is defined across multiple contexts and how it should be acted on or relied upon um, within various contexts as well, like healthcare or non-healthcare. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, um, several um, systems are already deployed in international airports, like uh, Shanghai Pudong Airport, and uh, uh, I believe uh, Frankfurt uh, Airport, and a few airports are already deployed, and they don't store the data. They uh, don't treat it as biometric data, and uh, they just do a pre-screening. Um, the one thing is quite interesting. Uh, studies show the fake camera is more useful than the real camera, in public settings. For example, uh, the, the nice uh, distribution is 50% of fake camera and 50% of real camera is uh, reduce the crime rate in uh, a lot of uh, uh, hot spots. Um, so there's one case, uh, I, I, you know, I really like the FDA's uh, cautious uh, warning. I think that's pretty good uh, because it's a really, really um, uh, immature technology. Um, but there's one case, there is a, a COVID-19 patient flew from uh, New York to, uh, to, uh, to Beijing and he had a fever 
and he took the medicine to suppress the fever, and he he lied. He, he said that he has no problem, and then when he landed in uh, Beijing airport, because there is a, a thermal imaging systems, so he confessed, and he said I have a, a, a COVID nineteen positive. So this, by this case, it stopped a lot of super spray cases, and um, this you know. So, so thermal imaging itself is not really effective to, to detect uh, the pre-symptomatic uh, cases, but it gave people a little warning. And uh, so eventually it stopped one case and they might prevent a thousand, maybe more cases. I guess one of the challenges that we have, given that we're you know, seeking to deploy these technologies with an uncertain disease where we yes. still don't know so much is, are we learning right now, experts tell us, you know, we'll face the threat of pandemic, you know, again, at some point, um, and, and uh, um, are we learning what is effective and what is not? Um, uh, you know, we're stopping people at airports. Do we have the data that says, well, we actually, you know, uh, of, a thousand people, you know, flagged as uh, having a raised temperature. Uh, here's how many actually, you know, on further follow-up uh, actually were infectious, or was it actually security theater, which may have, you know, made some people confess, um, or are we just spending a lot of, you know, money uh, and technology? Um, and, and I think some of the, you know, challenge, I don't know that it's privacy or if it's just not having the full scope of data collection is we, we won't know whether or not some of these things were actually of uh, a screening, um, uh, screening value. Um, uh, uh, th thoughts on perhaps the lack of data that um, we need um, either to ensure accuracy across different populations, across different um, uh, classes, groups, incomes, races, um, or, or effectiveness. Um, some of it, it seems, is privacy related. The, the leading um, contact um, uh, proximity tracing, the Google and Apple, you know, model, um, you know, went to great lengths to not collect location information. And there were some governments who said, we actually need location information because we want to, you know, study and have information about the effectiveness. And we've made some trade-offs to say, we don't think people will accept it if it collects too much information. Is there a trade-off in the information that we need to understand disparate impact, to understand effectiveness? How do we know if something is proportional, right, which is something I have to prove under GDPR, if I'm not collecting the information for, um, uh, for, for experts um, to be able to assess this? Um, can, we, can, can researchers, uh, you know, like you, Dr. Singh, with, you know, limited audiences that you recruit and assess uh, or do we need large populations? Um, what, what's the researcher sort of perspective on the sort of lack of data? And is that slowing down our ability to really assess what's working here? No, I, I think it's, a, it's a, a great point. And I think that that is really one of the important implications that we have and, and, and why I don't commit to does the voice detect COVID or not. It's because I haven't studied it in an appropriate setting with an appropriate population to make those determinations. It's, it's why I'm, I'm reaching out to my colleagues around different areas of, of our state to say, will you participate? And, and can we kind of co-collaborate on some of these studies? Again, to your point about getting a larger population with all sorts of uh, different cohorts of individuals, patients, social classes, race, age groups, to, to, to really get to a point where I can say, yes, this does um, do what I think it does based on my hypothesis, or no, it does not, and here's the data prove that. And, and ultimately, that's the, the true um, method of the scientific approach. Um, you know, to your point, the larger the studies, the, the more, you know, the more accurate the information, uh, the more uh, you find out about things that work that don't work. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think the, we need more. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough time because really this disease is only you know, several months old and we're learning so much about it, um, you know, each and every day. And and uh, again, the more um, the more people that we can enroll in some of these, uh, you know, and design uh, more of these trials to to really elucidate that that um, answer, I think the better. Yeah, and Dr. Singh, I'd, I'd like to add to that. Um, not only do we need um, a, a diversity in um, 
you know, in, in how or what type of data um, we collect to validate um, the use of the technology, but um, we need diversity in, in terms of how we examine the um, success of the technology from both a technical standpoint and also a behavioral standpoint or, or implementation standpoint even. Um, so the, the technical aspects or, or questions might be, does the technology do what we claim it does or, or does it do what we want it to do? And then if that answer is yes, the next step could be, okay, now let's look at implementation. Um, how, do we, um, how do we conduct studies in, in a randomized way, whether it's blinded, uh, controlled? Um, also, how do we account for Hawthorne effect, where individuals will behave differently when they know they're being watched or, or think they're being watched, um, whether or not it's true or not? Um, so I, I think we need to really think deeply about how we design the trials um, from both a technical and an implementation um, standpoint, because both will inform um, policy, uh, quite frankly, and both will inform um, the law in terms of how we should define the data collected uh, by these technologies. Um, so that way we make sure that it's, it, it's, for one, doing what it says it does, and then for two, to ensure that we're not hurting people or, or uh, creating imbalance between the benefits and risks of the technology implementation. Have we seen um, privacy enhancing technologies playing a role? Uh, there was discussion of local storage as being one way to avoid some concerns, um, uh, deleting data, obviously. Um, um, but Laurie or any of you, um, you know, thoughts on other um, emerging techniques that can support the utility while um, preventing um, some of the concerns. Um, uh, you know, so some of the, I don't know, biometric techniques sometimes are calibrated to actually not be accurate enough to identify, but accurate enough for a purpose. When I go to Disney and I swipe my finger, it's not a unique identifier, but it's unique enough that there's probably not somebody I can sell my ticket to because they'd have to have a match. Um, I, I believe similarly, uh, your iPhone, uh, 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 Apple, I think, tells us that um, it's unique enough that, you know, hopefully nobody near you is able to get in, but that it actually isn't unique enough um, to, uh, you know, be uh, of a more significant level. Uh, thoughts on anything you've been seeing uh, on that side of the front, uh, Lori or, uh, or others? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when we have very specific uses for the data, then we can more easily constrain what we collect or kind of downgrade what we collect so that we can um, basically throw out the parts that are not needed for that specific use case. Um, when, we, when we do something more general of, well, let's just, you know, collect lots of data because we can, that's when we tend to get into more privacy trouble because, you know, we've got all of it. We can come up with all sorts of things we didn't anticipate to use it for. And, you know, if we, if we throw away any of it, well, well, who knows, we might be, be you know, blocking some important usage. So, so I think, um, you know, to the extent that we're using biometrics, for very targeted and specific uses, we're going to have an easier time with addressing some of these privacy issues. What about ethics? Um, obviously, if I'm an academic or I'm running a federally um, funded project, I'm subject to oversight from an IRB, but we're talking about some of these technologies being deployed commercially uh, or in areas where um, the development or, or deployment isn't going to go through a an IRB. Um, so I may call Kirk for my legal compliance advice, um, and it might be perfectly legal, but I think we all see a range of ethical concerns. Where, Lisa, I guess you're a new, newly mitten ethics PhD specifically, right? Yes. Where do I go for the ethics ro rule without having a philosopher in-house or an ethicist um, what, what frameworks can I look to? Um, IRB is going to say, well, it's commercial data, not, not subject to our review or acceptable because, you know, it, it was previously collected uh, data. Where, where do we go with the, the gap in ethics review? Yeah, so while it's probably not as common as it should be, it is becoming uh, a little bit more 
we're seeing them more where you know, organizations are having review boards, right? Ethics review boards, if you will. Um, some of them are internal, um, some of them are external and can be, can be engaged, if you will, to help make those types of decisions. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, we're, we have an internal board that we, that we have, um, you know, where we look at technology and we look at uses of it, and we apply ethical principles. Um, I think there, and there are probably some benchmarking that we can share with other organizations similarly situated that have that. Um, but I do think, and I think Jules, there's been some conversations that we've been part of where there's uh, interest in looking at external review boards, right? Where, where you can, just as you can hire an IRB to come and look at this, you can have, you can also have an ethics review board that would look and help you decide um, what's, what's appropriate. I mean, it's building the right framework. It's having the principles that are that are appropriate to apply in those instances, um, rather than you know seeking out the moral authority on on how to use this data. I think we are at time, and um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I will note that the Future Privacy Forum is working on creating such an ethics review board to meet, I think, what we see as a as a gap there. And uh, if anybody's interested, we're happy to have your your thoughts and input. Um, but let me thank you, Lisa, for uh, really driving this uh, event and. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Craner and your colleagues, uh, and Dr. Singh and Dr. Kai and others who joined us uh, from their busy schedules. Kirk, thank you for your legal and policy acumen. Rachel, so thank you so much. Uh, the events team uh, and staff on both sides. Uh, Lisa, uh, a last word maybe to mention that we do have plans to do this in person when COVID clears and we come back to it again. I'll let you close uh, with those thoughts. We do, um, and of course, we're gonna let science and policy drive our decision, but um, our intent is to really have an in-person event like we had scheduled for April. Um, and so those of you who are participating now, please do look for something more um, in addition to that next year. And I think today's conversations really, um, um, really is, uh, have been fodder for those conversations next year. So um, I would suggest that some of these discussions and presentations have a part two next year. Um, particularly around the areas concerning COVID. I mean, I think there'll be lots of lessons learned that can, can get us into next year's discussion. We'll be working closely over the next couple of months to decide when that is, but um, uh, it's not an if, it's, it's a when. So, and I thank you to all of my colleagues for helping to coordinate this and um, it took a village, it truly did. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks everybody in the green we'll be there. So okay. uh, thanks everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys.